Good morning, church. Uh, yeah, that song always, that song always gets me. You know, that is, uh, that, that is the truth. That, in, that needs to be <clears throat> our, our desire um, to live for the Lord. Something that I'm continually learning, the Lord continually needs to take me to the woodshed about and, you know, some days are better than others, but, but the reality is this, right? Complete, total submission, no reservations, every area, every aspect of your life and my life have to be fully surrendered. We have to die to ourselves in order to experience the true blessedness of the Lord in our lives. Amen. You want to be used by the Lord. The first thing you have to do is die to yourself. Without death, there can be no blessing. And even in the sense of obviously the Lord coming in, in, in human form and going upon that cross and laying down his life. Uh, it took death. And so for us today, may that be somewhere in our prayer that the Lord would help us to die to ourselves. Amen. We're coming upon Thanksgiving and, and, uh, you know, even at the commencement of uh, the service, we'll pray over these boxes and just the importance of being thankful and grateful. Just the fact that you and I have been forgiven, have been redeemed that in its entirety, that's everything. That's, that's, that's the, that's the whole thing about life. Get saved, get redeemed, keep gratefulness in your heart. I mean, I'm up here, I'm seeing Noelle going off in worship, and it's like, why can she do that? Because she's not tainted. I get it. Everyone's born into the world uh, as a sinner, but what I'm saying, that's what the Jesus is always like. The little children are the ones who are going to inherit the kingdom of God. When we're, when, we're, when we're all crusty and we can't worship, there's something wrong with us. I'm just putting it out there. Don't let a little child out worship you. I know it's not about competition. It's not about that. But there is a praise and there's a joy in that young girl's heart. Regardless of whatever the circumstances are that she's able to praise the Lord. And there's a freedom in that. What did King David do? He danced himself out of his clothes in worship and praise to God. Why? To be weird? To be out there? To be kooky? No, because he didn't care. He was about, Lord, I'm, I'm praising you because I'm so grateful for what you've done in my life, for how you've saved me from my wretched state. It's very interesting because there is a climate, unfortunately, that has crept into the church. And I'm talking about in, 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 in the evangelical church here in the United States. I don't, it's not about Satan being outside we need to make sure Satan's not inside here preaching from pulpits, telling false truths about what's going on. A lot of this, yes, receive Jesus. I get that. Do we understand that we cannot receive Jesus unless we understand that we are wretched sinners by nature, sinful people that should perish under the righteous indignation of God because he is holy and we are not. See, that's not popular in the church today. Pastors don't want to talk about sin because they don't want to offend the congregation. But the word of God is very offensive. But his rebukes are just and true and they will bring forth fruit in your life and clarity in your vision if you allow him to speak into your life, into your heart. Amen? It is the truth. And so we just need to be on board with what is going on in the word. I'm super excited uh, for just this new chapter that, that we are as this portion of the body of Christ are headed into this new season, this new work that the Lord is, he's in our midst doing. And I, if you've been with us for any period of time, we've, we've gone through uh, the book of Acts, which I believe was very important. We needed to get back to foundational biblical truth. I mean, you never leave it, right? It just refreshes. But we took our time in Acts, seeing what does the church really look like? The church from the ground up. Right. We all have been there. We've all been a part of uh, the, 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 you know, uh, the falling out and the split. And, but it's been some time. Huh? 
and, and, and hopefully by now that, you know, wounds have healed and we have gotten more mature and we're growing spiritual roots deep in the vine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after Acts, we went into the book of Revelation and that was a great time um, just learning about what God has revealed through his word to his church about end times and about being ready, always being present for the Lord's return. And again, not getting caught up in the bowls of judgment and all these different things that are very fascinating. But the, at the end of the day, the book of Revelation is the reveal, the revealed truth of who Jesus Christ is and how every person in humanity has the opportunity to be redeemed and to be saved. And for anyone, there is no excuse at the end of the day, because he's made it abundantly and apparently clear who he is. Now, us as the church, we need to do our part to get that message out and be about our father's business. Amen. And I believe in this time since Pastor Nick was here and planted this church and then the Lord led him to a new calling. And then I you know, came in and the Lord brought me in to be the senior pastor of this church. I believe there was a, a, a definitely a period in a season of uh, of healing and, 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 then, and then growth and then kind of understanding what's going on and growing deep roots. Now, here, here we are now today in, uh, what is this, uh, November 20th, 2022. It's all about the Lord's timing. Amen. We, the Bible says, we as men and women make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. The Bible says we may throw the dice, but the Lord determines where they land. And, and even the best of intentions out of season, out of step with the Lord is not going to be fruitful and beneficial. I truly believe we are in a place now what the Lord has been revealing to me in his word is that this church is ready to launch out into getting more engaged with the community and, and not being so enclosed right here. Now, whether or not people decide to come that's 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 again the lord he he's the one who provides uh the growth we we either plant or we water but the lord gives the increase i'm not concerned about that what i'm concerned about is streamlined as the church i know we do it individually in our own lives and we should but as a church i believe the lord is calling us now where we are in a healthy place where we can be more engaged in that area of outreach. I know that there was a there was a there was a homeless ministry for years and it's probably still going on in St. James Park. And we have prayed about that years ago. And we're like, well this was something that Spring Valley was a part of, blah blah blah. Does the Lord call is he calling us to that? And you know, at the time I wasn't the pastor of this church, but we had we had been in prayer, the leadership, and we had agreed that no, the Lord is not calling us to that. That's a that's a that's a old work. That's a different work. That's a work for some other part of the body. We are here in Milpitas, and, and, and I'll get into it as I get into the message this morning, but the Lord has revealed things to me this week, and I've had an I've had a opportunity to be up close and personal to it, and I, I know I've been to, 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 to the community where we are supposed to outreach to, and it's right here. It's about, 10, it's about 10 minutes away, right down the street, on the same street that we're on. And so I'm just excited about that, and I'm so excited because the timing of the Lord is impeccable. The ending the book of Revelation, I was in prayer about it. Lord, where do you want to lead your church? And, you know, when my mom was not well in the hospital up at UCSF for two and a half weeks, the times I went up there, I would read the book of James to her. And as I read that book, I was so sure, okay, Lord, that's the book we're going through next, the book of James. It's just practical application of how to live this Christian life, how to live it out day by day, how to keep short accounts with you, how to control the tongue, all the, all the great nuggets of truth that are found in that book. And I was, so, I was so just impressed that that is the book we're going to go through next, even so much that I told a couple people. I think I told Gene. I said, yeah, we're going to go through that book next. <laughs> you know, the Lord has a way of, of, of stirring things up and shaking things up and being like, all right, slow your roll. <laughs> Keeping not, not so fast. We are going to go through that book, Lord willing, given time. Um, but the Lord had brought me to a different book, and we're going to introduce that book this morning. It's the book of Haggai. And I wasn't really too familiar with that book, but it's such a good book. And it's so timely because everything that's found in that book is playing into where we are personally at as a church right now, present day. If you know anything about the book, 
It's very convicting. It's very convicting. Because you have the remnant of God's people doing one thing, and then God's prophet saying, stop. Your priorities are out of whack. What does the Bible say? Return to what? Your first love. Return to your first love. Now, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not speaking of, I'm not saying people here are, are in some kind of backslidden state. I'm not saying that. But, what, but God's word is clear. We are to ever present every day, moment by moment, ensure that your priorities and my priorities line up with his. And when our priorities line up with his, things work out even in the worst of circumstances. When our priorities are wrong and we put our desires or our skewed perception of things first before his, that's when it's all bad. So I pray that as we go through this overview this morning, you're going to be encouraged. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be excited for the next several weeks that we spend in this book. It's a short book. I do believe it's only 38 verses, two chapters, but it's very insightful. And, and, and as I was reminded by my wife and, uh, uh, you know, Brother Daniel, who's, who's not here, pray for him. He's just uh, house sitting and, you know, a little under the weather. But, you know, we need to make sure that we get all the fine details in the Word of God. You know, many times when we skim over and we just read, we're not, we're not, we're not comprehending what we're reading. We miss out on the details, you know. But interesting thing that the, the Lord spoke into my life through Veronica this week was, did you, do you realize that, that uh, whose line did, did Jesus come from? I said, the line of, the line of David. She said, yeah, they're correct. She said, who was, who was Jesus' father? I said, Joseph. I said, yeah, okay. What are you getting at? She's like, do you understand that, that Jesus was adopted? He's not, he's, not, he's, not, he's not from Joseph physically. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. He's not his physical offspring. What are you trying to tell me? <laughs> you know, I'm like, you're stumping me. What, what are you trying to show me? She said, in every way. The Lord has experienced everything that everyone on earth has ever gone through, even down to the minute micro detail of someone being adopted. That our Lord was adopted. How many children out there don't have a home, don't have a physical parent that they can call their own, that are, that are shipped from, from foster parent to foster parent and feel neglected emotionally? Have questions of why did my father, why did my, my mother abandon me? Why did they leave me? But you know, that person who's hurting inside with that, Jesus can relate. He relates on every level to every person who's ever walked through this earth. So I don't know where you're at today, but I know if you put all your trust and all your hope in Jesus Christ, you will not be let down. Amen. You will be encouraged. With that, uh, this morning, the sermon is going to be just a little bit different. Uh, just because this is an introduction to the book. So I'm not going to per se read a portion of scripture right now. So I'm not going to ask you to stand up for the reading of God's word. But there are plenty of reference verses that we're going to get into. But if you would like, please uh, find yourself and turn to the book of Haggai. Because that's where we're going to be uh, this morning. And uh, referencing to a lot of Old Testament books. So to start off. Just a little bit about the author and somewhat try to pinpoint the date around approximately around when this book was um, was written. So the book of Haggai contains messages delivered by the prophet Haggai. And it's reasonable to consider that he was the author. He was the author that was uh, physically inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen uh, this book. His name means festive. In Hebrew, or my holiday, speaking of the Lord, not, not Haggai's, <laughs> but the Lord's holiday, his festive. His birth may have occurred during the festival of Israel, or perhaps links his name with his message, his timely message to, his peop to the children of Israel. So, you see, he anticipated the restoration of Israel's great feasts within a restored temple. The temple was in ruin. In Haggai's day, the temple laid in ruin. And so Haggai was used as a messenger of God to encourage the people 
to rebuild the temple. He is one of 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. We don't know anything of his genealogy, so I can't go in and, and, and kind of talk to you about, you know, who, who did he come from? Uh, you know, I, I don't have that information readily available to me. And obviously, there's some times where the Lord leaves different details out. And I think that's probably for good reason, because he didn't want us to be concerned about that. I think more so he is so concerned about the message that the prophet Haggai brought forth. That is what is important. That is what we are supposed to feast on and take in and apply to our lives so that we may benefit and others around us may be blessed. Amen. The specific mention of the second year of Darius uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, places the book in the year 520 B.C. Haggai prophesied to the people of Jerusalem after they had returned from Babylon in 538 B.C. The walls in the temple of Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonian armies in uh, about 586 B.C. Within a year after returning from Babylon... The people had laid the foundation for the new temple, but in Haggai's time, th those, those foundations, they weren't built upon. It was just the foundation. That was it. It was like a job half done <laughs> or a quarter done. It got started, but that was it. Nobody came along. Nobody felt the need to continue on with the work. And so this is the dilemma that this prophet is facing. This is the dilemma that the nation of Israel is facing. They had just been let out of captivity. The work began for the temple, but it was never completed. Haggai, together with Zechariah, called upon the people to stop focusing on their own personal economic well-being and complete the temple. That's, that's going to be the main theme of this book. This, this, is, this is the main crux right here. And it all goes back to Christ. It all, we can always apply it to us. We can always apl apply it to Christ. Who are we living for? What are we living for? Are we more concerned about our own personal pleasures and our own desires and our own well-being? Or are we truly and honestly living for God and being about His business? That is the question that we must be honest and ask of ourselves, lest we live a lie of deception and think that we are doing the right thing when we are foolishly just living a life that is not honoring God at all. And that's why I say this book is so convicting, because it forces you to ask the question, where are you with the Lord? What are you truly doing with your time? What am I doing with my time? Am I honoring the Lord in all that I do? That's why singing that last song, I can't even sing that song the whole way through. I start bawling because I'm like, man, Lord, these words, you know, it's real. How can I sing? I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Are you doing that? You see, God is after your heart. He's after my heart. He's after your actions. He's after my actions. He doesn't care for this lip service. And I'm not trying to come down on anyone. I'm just putting out what's been shown to me throughout this week. So much talk, not enough action, leads to deception. Do not allow yourself to deceive yourself by your own flesh or let Satan deceive you by thinking if it sounds good, it's all good. Our actions have to line up with what we say we believe or else we are living a lie. Amen? <laughs> I, didn't want, I didn't say nobody want to say amen after that. I'm like, man, I'm going to smacked around over here. And like I said, please understand that none of this is coming from uh, any line of, of, of trying to, you know, overlord over you or anything like that. It comes from a place of love. The, love, the, the, the Lord loves those He rebukes. He chastens those He calls children of Himself. Any, 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 any character in the Bible you see constantly reproving of. We're constantly in the refiner's fire. This is us becoming more like Christ. We must be reminded of these things lest we fall into a position where we think we're okay when we're really not. We, we, we don't hear these things, then we start thinking we got it all together when we don't. 
And we need to constantly lean upon the Lord for all things, for every day of our life. Amen? The book of Haggai is an extremely relevant book today. It's a timeless book. It's a timeless book. You could never exasperate this book or the Word of God at all. And, and this, is, this is another, this is just a side point. But this, this, this just, this, just um, <laughs> this supports the idea or this supports the belief that you need the Old Testament. There's some weird false doctrine floating around the church right now. And I guess it's been around for quite some time. But some believers, some true, genuine, honest, believing Christians believe you don't need the Old Testament. <laughs> you don't need the Old Testament. You just need the New Testament. <laughs> but, but what they fail to realize is there, there's far more grace in the Old Testament than one would believe. And there's far more judgment in the New Testament than one would want to believe or give credence to. But you need the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. The Old Testament is all about pointing to the Messiah. It's all about prophetic things that are pointing to his return and who he was going to be and what was going to happen. So how could we ever say we don't need the Old Testament? Now, I get it. There's people in other places of the world. They're getting saved off off one page of the book of John. That's fine and dandy. But that's, that, that's their particular situation. But I can guarantee you they're hungry for the whole word of God. They're not just trying to live off one page from the book of John. But you got people out here, kooks, that are quacked up. And they're trying to teach that you don't need the whole counsel of God, the inspired word of God, the, the closed canon of scripture from Old Testament to New Testament, that you don't need all that. That's a lie from the pit of hell. So as we go through, when you go through in your personal time, anytime you're in any book of the Bible, old or new, understand that it's all relevant it's re and, and it's all pointing to Christ and who Jesus is. And when you come from it from that standpoint, you just get blown away by the truths that the Lord and the Holy Spirit reveals to you through his word. You're like, man, this is just amazing. I can only imagine what it's like for, for Christians that live in this country and then they're fortunate enough to go to Israel. And they go on those tours or whatever. I mean, that must be mind-blowing to see the actual physical locations where these things took place. You talk about making it real to you. It's like Thomas. What did Thomas say? Until I see. <laughs> Jesus said, man, blessed is the one that, that believes and doesn't even see. So that, he's talking about you and me. We don't see Christ physically. You're blessed. But could you imagine just, you know, what it is to go over to the Middle East and see these places, see these monuments, see the geographical places and the structures and the ruins that are there? Oh, that must just, that must encourage the believer so much. And you just come back from that and you're just on fire. I can't remember, probably Michelle or Lou, you guys probably remember, it was a Filipino man that went to Spring Valley. He ended up going over there. That was when I first met Veronica. I started going over there. And uh, maybe you too, Mary, you probably remember. I don't know, uh, but... He was a Filipino man, and he actually did some time with the, with, the, with the army in Israel. I can't remember his name. You remember his name, Sal? Nick. 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 Yeah, yeah, man, I miss that. I miss that, I miss that brother, man. Uh, Lord, ho hopefully he's, he's doing well, but, you know, that was just super cool. You know, just hearing about that and, and the things that he would share with me, it was like, he was a very quiet-spoken, you know, man, but um, he was super about it, and he was just like, I'm going there, and he went. <laughs> He went and he served and he came back. I think he came back with the with the with the Israeli flag and he was just so proud of that. That was just a, such a cool thing. But you know, gosh, just makes scripture scripture come alive. This is a beautiful thing. Uh, but again, this book is so relevant to our lives today, saints, because it shows us the need to put God's work first in your life and mine. Put Him first. Your life always ends up better when you put. God first. And I, and I know, unfortunately, from too many poor choices in my own life, that when I put myself before the Lord, it always ends up messed up. <laughs> it always messes up. It never turns out right. I always end up kicking myself like, man, such a fool. Why did I do that? Why did I choose that route? Why did I choose to go that way? When it could have been so much better if I would have just put the Lord first in all my dealings. You see, for the prophet's society back then, the rebuilding of the temple would be the visible sign of the people's determination to put God first. 
the rebuilding of the temple, it showed that they were putting the Lord first. But the fact that they were so involved in their own personal, personal economic gain showed that they were not putting the Lord first. They were not. And they were suffering for it. So we can ask this question, right? Because I'm all about application. I think knowledge without application makes you a fool, right? The Bible is clear about that. He doesn't want us to just have a bunch of head knowledge. He wants us to actually have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to apply the principles of the word of God. And that's how we see it manifest and become what it's supposed to be in our life and in the lives of others. So the question to ask, ask is this, what does putting God first in your life, in my life, what is it supposed to look like? Right? Because we can hear it, but it's like, what does it actually look like? Tell me what it looks like. So I have, so I have a reference point to gauge off of so I can know, am, am I, am I getting closer to that? Or am I super, super far away from my life actually uh, being uh, honoring God and putting him first. Well, Matthew chapter 22 verses 37 down through 40 tell us clearly what it's supposed to look like. It says, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Not just a little bit, <laughs> not just a whole lot, but not all. Not just 99.9%, .9%, right? We hold that one thing back. No, he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul and with all of your mind. What does that show us? That means it's concentrated. It's focused. We put effort, we put energy into loving God. Goes on to say, this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's what putting the Lord first in your life and my life looks like. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. If we're not doing that, we are not putting God first. Church attendance ain't going to cover it up. Reading God's word, five chapters a day ain't going to cover it up. It's loving the Lord your God. And you would think if you're reading the Bible five chapters a day, there should be a working in you that you're getting rearranged and things are coming out to where you're putting God first and you're loving him with all your soul, with all your heart, mind, and strength, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself. I talked earlier about there's, there, there's, there's a new work that the Lord is doing in this church. So just the backstory, my wife was at, and, and, and you can tell her about this, it's okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get chewed out for, for sharing this. But Veronica was at Safeway about three weeks ago, and she saw a second cousin, I think, a second cousin of hers, an ex, you know, extended family member in, in line in the Safeway. And from previous experiences, knowing this individual, he had a rough patch in his life where he was an addict. And when she saw him at the Safeway, he looked a whole lot better than she had seen you know previously so you know they kind of got to briefly talking a little bit and uh, he had said that you know yeah he's doing a lot better blah, blah blah yada yada and that he was staying at a homeless encampment behind the embassy suites and so I guess my wife was kind of thrown for a loop because she's like well you look a whole lot better what do you mean homeless encampment and so it turns out that the city of Milpitas actually took over uh, the Extended Stay America, which is behind the embassy suites right down the street from where this physical church building is, and they've converted, into, converted it into hilltop apartments. And so it's just like I think the city of Oakland did it as well. It's for people who were, during the pandemic, who were either on the verge of becoming homeless or they were homeless or they were going through rough times and they have a place to live and not be on the street. And so this is something, obviously, and I know the, 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 ladies, the ladies group has been praying about this for a long time. It's like, you know, how do, you know, what are we supposed to be doing? You know, how we, we know that we're not just supposed to be in these walls. This is not it. I get it. This is super important, but this is not it. And, you know, me and Veronica were talking, and she was like, yeah, she's like, yeah, I wanted to, you know, get more information from him and this and that. And so, you know, I had been in prayer for a couple of days, but, you know, you get it when <laughs> it's like there's some things Man, you don't need to pray about. The Lord done already showed you how much you got to pray about it. 
If the Lord says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, what more do you need to know? And so last was a Monday night, you know, I, I you know, again, foolish. <laughs> Lord, what, what, do you, what do you want to do? <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you want me to do, Lord? I, I just use me, Lord. <laughs> help, me, help me be a blessing in my community. <laughs> and the Lord's like, you know, I didn't hear no audible voice, but, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this. I can't. I can't explain it, but it's something that comes so sudden and so quick, and it's so crystal clear. The Lord's basically like, my son, look, you the pastor of this church. You got flyers. You got a big old box of flyers in your closet. You're the pastor of this church. What better person? Go over there and go engage with these people. Go interact with them. Go talk to them. Go invite them. Show a presence that there's a church that's here that, that cares. And so I'm like, all right, Lord. So Tuesday morning, made sure my backpack was full of flyers. When I got off work, I came over here, went over, and I prayed. I said, Lord, I just pray for a divine encounter. I just prayed to engage with someone and meet somebody. Let me, let me, let me rub shoulders with somebody so, so we can establish some kind of relationship. And sure enough, about five or six people sitting outside that lobby... Even the worker, a worker there, and I, you know, the lady was like, oh, hi, uh, sir, how can I help you? And I said, you know, whatever, yada, yada, I'm pastor of a local church right down the street, and I want to know if I can leave some flyers. She said, oh, you know, you can't solicit anything inside, but you're more than welcome to talk to everybody out here. And I, sure enough, what I did. So I talked to like five or six people, and it was just such a great blessing. I mean, there was one gentleman, an older gentleman, and, you know, he, he came up to me, and he had a... He had a, a, a beat down, you know, um, a Gideon's Bible, you know, New Testament Bible. He's like, I read this every day. I said, praise God. I said, bless you, sir. Come through to the church. Yada, yada. Uh, saw this other lady. She's like, man, you're such a blessing. I just prayed about Lord. Where do I, I need to go to a church? I said, well, there's a church right here. There's a church building right down the street. I said, if you're walking, it's about 10, 15 minutes, depending on how fast or slow you walk. So you're more than welcome. Come through come through it's another lady and uh it was just great because i you know i was just like we don't we just want you guys to come we don't want no money <laughs> we we don't want none of that you don't got to get dressed up you you come you come as you are and, and and come get blessed and come get encouraged and come get the support that you need and there was a lady that uh one of the last people I talked to, two ladies. One was holding a baby, and then I guess the other one who wasn't holding the child, that was her granddaughter. And she said that her, her, her daughter is trying to get her life together and trying to get some help, and the, the, the grandma has custody of this baby now. And as she was talking to me, and this baby was just looking, me, looking at me dead in my eyes, she said, you know, she said, my granddaughter was born on heroin, and she struggled for such a long time. Because she was born jonesing, you know. She was born to a, a mother who was on heroin, a heroin addict. And obviously that was in her bloodstream. And it just got so real to me looking at that little baby, looking at, looking at that young girl's eyes. It's like, Lord, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is where we're supposed to be. This is the community we are supposed to be reaching out to. You see, I don't even want to call them homeless because they're not homeless. They have a community right there. But I don't know if it's, obviously, it's us reaching out to them. And, you know, Veronica, we're doing a bunch of stuff. Veronica's working on getting a, 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 a sign made. But it's beyond a sign. I'm talking about if we need to go over there and do Bible study with these people. If there are, you know, women that need help with certain things, men that need help. But, but the opportunity is right there. And that's what I truly believe the Lord is calling us to do as Resilient Life Church right here on this strip whatever this is, Jacqueline and Hillview, and get involved with these people. There's all kind of people over there that need it, that need that encouragement. I'm telling you, I ran into five or seven people, and every single person was receptive. Another man was like, oh, yeah, I go to Emmanuel Baptist, but I'll check you out. And, you know, I left a stack of flowers. I said, man, hand these out to all your, all your folks. Hand them out to people. Let people know there's a real Bible-believing church right on this street 
And you're more than welcome to come at any time. And I'm so encouraged because that, that's, what, that's what was blowing me away all week. Lord, why do you have, why did you tell us to, to why did you tell me to put the, the book of James on hold? <laughs> because he's showing me right here. Be about my business. The children of Israel, the remnant, and I'm always talking about the remnant. And here in this particular situation, the remnant was being rebuked because they were not doing what the Lord had called them to do. Again, going back to that scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? It's all those people. It's anybody. It's all the children. We don't even know who they are, who all these boxers are going to on the other side of the world. That is our neighbor. And if we are not willing to be compassionate towards them and, and, and bleed for them in the sense that, man, I don't want to see anybody go through that. My heart, bre- you know, we watch those Operation Christmas Child videos. Man, my heart breaks every time I hear every one of those stories. There should be that component within us as believers in Christ where we're moved by these things we see. You've seen a, 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 a seven-month-old baby born addicted to heroin. That should move you to action. Not just, oh, I I feel it, but it's like, I feel it enough to let's engage. Let's do the do. (laughs) Let's be about our father's business. We, I preach it all the time. That's why you and I are still here on this planet, because there's a work to be done in and through our lives. That's going to bring honor and glory to God. But there's no other way to do it than to actually. I love what J. Vernon McGee would always say when he was alive. This is where the rubber meets the road. It's when your faith becomes real and it becomes tangible and it becomes infectious to those around you. This ain't fake. I ain't no cheerleader. I'm not trying to pump you up. This is what the Holy Spirit has been imparting in me for a long time and I'm seeing it coming to fruition. We have a great opportunity as believers in Jesus Christ to be a blessing to many people, to many people right here, right now in real time. After thousands of years, the book of Haggai Haggai remains largely unique among the books of the Old Testament prophets for one key reason. Through the physical act of rebuilding the temple, the people began to see a shift in their personal spiritual lives. Why was there a shift? Because they were about their father's business. Because they stopped being so engaged in their personal affairs. And they started putting God first. And they started to grow. They started to mature spiritually. They started to love and care about one another. And most importantly, the work of the Lord that encompasses people. But that radically changes lives. From devotion to self towards devotion to God. For us today, we can experience this same kind of spiritual shift in our lives by seeking to do the Lord's will in all we involve ourselves in. And that's again why it's, that, that song is so risk. Man, those words are so off the hook. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment that I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. What does that look like? I think you guys know what it looks like. It's time for us to act. Amen. Some historical background. Haggai ministered among the Jews who had returned to Judea after some 70 years of exile in Babylon. Again, in 586 B.C., the temple was destroyed. The Persian ruler Cyrus the Great captured Babylon in 539 B.C. And in 538, he allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem so that they might rebuild the temple. You can read about that in Ezra chapter 1 and 2. The work of the rebuilding stalled when opposition arose. In Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, I'll read it for context. It says... When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua of Jehoadak with his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, the son of Shediel, with his kinsmen. And they built an altar 
of the God of Israel to offer burnt offering, offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings unto, unto the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. This is one thing to take note of. Anytime you and I step out in a mighty work for the Lord, anytime you say, Lord, have your way in me, <laughs> do as you will. May my life count for you. Expect opposition. Just like Nehemiah, Nehemiah had this strong desire to want to see the wall rebuilt. And as soon as he got to Jerusalem, he encountered all kind of opposition. So just understand that all hell will break loose in your life for wanting to honor the Lord. But you serve the true and living God. You serve El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. You serve, you serve Elohim. You serve the one who is above all. So he will protect you and guide you. Don't allow the, the distractions... Uh, all of the, the, the Hittites, the, you know, Hezborites, the mosquito bites, as one pastor likes to call them. Don't, let them. don't let the naysayers deter you from the work that the Lord wants to do in and through your life. And this is where being spiritually prayed up is so important. Even into, the regard, in, even into regards into fasting for certain things. Fasting, being prayed up. Being in the Word, being in close contact with God on a regular basis. This is what's going to help you to engage in the warfare that you're going to have to fight through in order to accomplish the Lord's will for your life and to be a blessing to others around us. Amen. So that's important that we need to remember this aspect. It's not just going to come without a fight. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be things that we may have to struggle through. But we do have the Lord on our side. Amen. You see, Haggai prophesied in an effort to motivate the people to renew their work of temple restoration. I have a question for all of us this morning, and the question is this. Is there any restoration of any kind that is needed in your life today? You don't have to answer it out loud. <laughs> Just think about it. Is there any kind of restoration that is needed in your personal life, in your spiritual life today? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. The second one is this. Can you identify it? Can you identify what needs to be restored in your heart? If you can, amen, praise God. If not, we can pray about it. We can pray about it. God's a good God. He pulls no punches. He'll show you crystal clear. <laughs> Trust me. Go through it all the time. What is needed to be taken out of your life? Okay. We're going to go on to the theme. What's the theme of this book? Well, the work of temple restoration highlights the Lord's desire to renew a covenant relationship with his people. And this is, this is another beautiful thing of why the one and true God is such a good, good God. Because he's a covenant God. And he doesn't break his promises, right? Men and women, we make, we make promises, we break them all the time. But God is a covenant God and he breaks no promises. He keeps his promises. That's why when this world is done away with, it's not going to be done away with with water. Because he said, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to flood this earth and rid people of the earth by a flood anymore. That's what the whole rainbow, his bow flung towards the heavens symbolizes. And there's so many accounts of his covenant and his promise keeping found in the word of God that we cannot exasperate the many promises of the covenantal promises he's given to his people and those who choose to be part of the vine and are grafted in as we as Gentiles are. But Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 31 down through 34 tells us, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them 
and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Man, isn't that a beautiful promise? Isn't that something to cling on to and to hold on to and to know that that is the God you serve? That's what he says. That's what he says. For any person that would be willing to surrender and submit and say that you are alone God Almighty and your son Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He will forgive your iniquity and remember your sin no more. You can walk and live with a clear conscience. You can walk without shame. You can live without guilt. You can do things in the strength of God, in the love of God, in the wisdom of God, because He has imparted unto you His Holy Spirit to live within you, to guide you every step of the way. Amen? I mean, these things, it's not, it's not, it's not Hollywood. You can't make this stuff up. That's why I'm so blown away by that, by that experience that I had at the Hillview Apartments because I didn't drum it up. I'm not smart enough to do something like this. I, I can't, you know, figure out and plot and try to, you know, this is all led by the Lord. And it's such a beautiful thing. It's like these boxes. I mean, look, look at how many boxes that you guys did. We're not, we're a small group of people, but that's a blessing within a blessing in every single box. Why? Because each box represents not just a boy or a girl, but a whole family. A whole family, that's a mama, that's a papa, that's a grandpa, that's a grandma, that's an aunt, that's an uncle, that's a cousin that that's going to affect. Do you see the importance of one person? You witness to one person. Do you understand how important that one person is? Jesus said it himself. He said he'll leave the 99 and go seek the one. Heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. Nobody is invaluable to God. Nobody. Because if that was the case, then pff, who are we? But you see, that's the lie of Satan. Satan wants you to believe, well, who are you to do anything for the Lord? What good could you do? Our, our country's falling apart. School's falling apart. If you read the curriculum of what they're teaching our children in public schools it would make you throw up. It's horrible. The task seems insurmountable. But with God, all things are possible. Person by person, you start one person at a time. Start with yourself. Revival in your own heart. Right living with God in your own life. And then you start playing tag. You just start tagging people one by one in your family, on your workplace, in the community. That's how real change, biblical change occurs. I heard a great message this morning. The reality is this. Institutional Christianity has failed. It's gone. It's done. But biblical Christianity is alive and well. What I mean by that is institutionalized Christianity. This whole just go to church and it's all good. Unfortunately, we have so many spiritually illiterate Christians in this country. That's why we're in the state that we're in. I'm not getting political. I'm telling the truth. If people would just read their Bibles, they would not be deceived by these false teachers that have crept into the church, spreading heresy, spreading nonsense, sp spreading all of this. I mean, all you had to do is just, if you seek the information out, it's crazy the stuff that some churches are letting happen, go on. I'm all for any person that's a sinner to come in. What I'm not for is for any person that's a sinner to come in and parade their beliefs and indoctrinate Christians with their false truths within the church. That is heresy. That is never okay. I don't care if you say you're no sex. Come. <laughs> but we're not going to have, we're going to teach you the scripture. <laughs> and I truly believe all that sin is no different than the sin of adultery and whatever. It's all the same. 
It's sin. It's not right. It's not a good thing. But to 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 engage in this thing where we allow these people to come into the church and start preaching from pulpits, things that are clearly in error and against the word of God is not OK. But again, one person at a time, <laughs> one person at a time. Trust that the Lord is going to do a mighty work in and through your life and you will see a change. Key themes in this book of Haggai. The first is the restoration of God's house. See, in their time, back in the day, a decaying temple, a decaying physical temple, signified a decaying relationship with the Lord. The fact that that, that temple laid in ruins was, 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 was a direct connection to the children of Israel's relationship with God. It was decaying. It was non-existent. It was, it was an afterthought. They were living in the past. They were living off of prior miracles and prior blessings. You see, you and I don't ever want to be in a place in our Christian walk where we're talking about, oh, you remember the good old days? I mean, it's cool to, to, to be able to reminisce, but if you don't have anything current that you're like, the Lord is moving in this in my life, in this situation, in my family, in my, at my work, blah, blah, blah. If you don't have anything where you're like, the Lord is moving, then you are like the children of Israel, this remnant that is not really living. You're decaying spiritually because God is always at work. It's are we aware of his work within our midst? That's the thing we have to be aware of. I mean, everybody should be coming in here talking about, I got a praise report about this, this and that. And you're going to have, you know, hard stuff too. You can be like, man, this was a crazy thing that went on. And this was a trial that we're walking through. But it should be something that's always fresh. How could it not be? We serve the true and living God. If he's true and living, does that mean he's ever stagnant? Absolutely not. He's always doing a new work. But if you got these old, crusty, wrinkled, old wineskins, what did Jesus say? I'm not going to put new wine in old wineskins because them old wineskins can't hold the life of the new wine. It's going to burst. But if your wineskins are renewed and fresh, that means, again, your heart is being renewed daily. Your soul is being renewed by the washing of the word of God in your life. Then that means you have fresh wineskins and he continually can pour into you because he knows you're going to pour out. He's not going to pour into you and me if we're just a stagnant pool like the Dead Sea because all those blessings are just sitting there. Okay, that's cool. But he's like, I'm trying to pour into you so that you can be poured out to others. You see, this is, and I love what Va used to say, God bless him. He would say, this is a one another ministry. This is a one another ministry. It's about other people. It's not about you. I had to have this real, we, me and Veronica had to have this real conversation with Kalos about the boxes last night. He's like, I wish I had that toy. Oh, I want this. Like, son, your heart's not right, son. You have a million toys, son. And of all these toys, they break in a day and you're over them. The luster lasts for five minutes and you're done. I said, do you understand that these children don't have anything? So you, you, it's not about you. But even in that, in teaching my son that, the Lord's showing me, it's not about me. And now I'm telling you, church, it's not about you. It's about the people around you. It's about being a blessing to those who need it so bad. Again, we're on the eve of Thanksgiving. Think of all the things that you and I should be grateful for. I don't... I'm not going to say I don't care because that's insensitive, but I'm going to say this. Even in your worst of situations, you have something to be grateful for. But you see, it's a matter of perspective. Where are we looking? Are we looking at our woe, our woe is me playing our little violin? Or are we looking at the God of all creation that in spite of all the hard things that you and I have had to walk through, he's still been gracious. He's still been merciful. He's still been loving. He's still been caring. He's still been providing. Because it's a matter of heaven or hell. Souls hang in the balance. That's what these, again, I can't, I, I keep bringing up these boxes because these boxes are in front of me. But that's what these boxes are all about. It's about the Lord taking someone's soul out of the pit and bringing that life and that soul to be restored in him so that they can have eternity with him. And in everything you and I are going through, that's the same thing. 
And that's why you're always going to experience that push and that, and, 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 and that friction. Because Satan doesn't want you to go forth with the plans that the Lord has for you because he knows souls are going to be saved. And he doesn't want to see souls saved. So it's like, well, someone else will do it. Someone else will do it. Again, speaking of this decaying temple, back then the temple was connected to God's people. This is how God connected to the people of Israel, through the temple. When the rebuilding of the temple was neglected, it brought weakness rather than holiness to the people. You see, we want to be people who live it out. We don't want to be those that just talk about it. How can we today restore the Lord's house, so to speak? Simple. By reaching out to other people about Jesus Christ. By putting ourselves out there and being involved in other people's lives. Service, quite simple. To be a servant. You know, to be a servant, to serve. The church is called to serve. We are, ser- we are called to serve one another, and then we are called to serve the world around us. It's all about service. It's never about any recognition. It's all about service. The recognition always goes to Jesus Christ. You know, any pastor that wants to sit up on a soapbox and not involve themselves in the work themselves, do not do not allow yourself to be led by a man in that manner because that is not a man after God's own heart. Leadership should be the first. Should be the first. Nehemiah got down and dirty with the work of, of the wall. He didn't just tell people what to do. He was involved in it himself. And that's what I'm learning. I need to be involved in the work myself. This is nothing. <laughs> Anybody can get up and read the Bible. It's about what are you doing? How are you living on a daily basis? That's where the truth comes to life. The second theme of this book is the prophetic word is the divine word. The prophecy is delivered by the hand of Haggai, but it's God's word. Men are simply messengers of the word. They are not God. And clearly you know, I am not God. (laughs) I am just a messenger. But you see, I share this because it's important. People should never become enamored by the messenger, but by the message itself. When a person becomes more interested with the man delivering the message than the God who imparts the message, that's a problem. And I see that going on in the church a whole lot. People are so enamored with the personality. People are so enamored with the man. Be enamored with Jesus. You see, I'm dispensable. I'm replaceable. I am just a vessel and a vehicle that the Lord is choosing to use so enough that as long as I remain humble and faithful, he will continue to use me. But as we know far too well, when men fall off, God is like, I'm not, you're not capable of being used anymore. You're no longer clean. You need to get yourself clean. And then if it's my will, maybe I'll use you again. There's too many examples in the word. We need to be enamored with the one who imparts the blessing, who imparts the truth, who gives the truth. Because once we start pushing up a man and boasting in a man, I don't care if it's the president of the United States. I don't care if it's the president of a company. I don't care if it's your granddaddy. I don't care if it's your father. That is sin and that is idolatry. You have now, I have now made that person a God and that should never be so. You see, the Lord alone is sovereign. The phrase Lord of hosts occurs 14 times in these 38 verses in this short book. The Lord gives the divine word He alone is the one who controls the fortunes of his people and the nations. He directs nature, motivates people to action, and establishes and removes kingdoms. Isaiah chapter 45 verses 7 through 9 tells us, I, speaking of God, form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open up that salvation and righteousness, righteousness, excuse me, may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them to both, both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him, who formed him, 
a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who formed it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. So you see clearly, we are those who are to be honoring God and to be used by God for his glory, for his honor. The application is simply this. Complete submission is essential in your walk and my walk with Jesus Christ. I, I started the message with that. And again, we see this theme, complete submission. You and I will never experience the fullness of his blessings without it. Without it. And I get it. There's times where we struggle, but this should be a goal of ours to grow in our submission to Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Who remembers this old commercial? Was it American Express or Visa? Don't leave home without it. Remember, I'm, I'm dating myself now. <laughs> was, it, was it American Express? Don't leave home without it. Well, see, for Christians, we should have a slogan saying, Obedience! Don't leave home without it. <laughs> because it's in your obedience and it's in my obedience that we become, we draw closer to the Lord and we experience more of His fullness. If you want to experience more of the fullness of Jesus Christ, become more obedient. Amen? It truly is the only way. There's just, just there's no workaround. And the third theme is this. People must work. People must work. A restored house will bring pleasure and glory to the Lord and blessing to the people. But there is work to be done. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It, it doesn't. It's not just going to whimsically, magically appear. Blood, sweat, tears, elbow grease, thought, focus, prayer, fasting, that all got to go into it. That's what makes it. But that's the beauty of the journey. And that's what, we get to, that's what we get to engage in as brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not doing it alone. Nehemiah didn't do it alone. Haggai didn't do it alone. Resilient Life Church is not going to do it alone. We need to come together and be a part of it as soldiers in arms in Christ to do the work of our Father. Amen. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 23 tells us, In all toil there is profit. But mere talk tends only to poverty. That's it. <laughs> in all work, in all toil, there's profit. But if we just talk about it, if we just sit around in our prayer groups and we're just like, oh yeah, this, this, that, and we don't do anything, it's going to lead to poverty. We need to be about our Father's business. In what we do, in our deeds, not merely sitting around talking about it. Now, obviously, we're not supposed to go out there half-cocked without any kind of vision or any kind of direction by the Holy Spirit and just start doing stuff because that's not good either because we serve a God of order, right? He's going to give an order. He's going to give a direction. He's going to give a command. And at that point, it's time for us to get out there and do what we're supposed to do. But once we know what to do and we've been given the, 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 the command, we have no excuse to not be obedient, and follow the instructions of the Lord. Physical labor is urged, but there's also a heart work to be done. And I think this is the most important thing, the heart. Because you can do all this physical stuff, but if your heart's not in the right place, it serves no good. It's all done in vain. And the Lord will not honor it if your heart is not right. Again, there's, it's crazy. This shoebox, man, we were teaching our kids all kind of lessons. <laughs> last night i mean it was hardcore it was supposed to be a cheery you know but it wasn't it was like a lot of tears being shed it was a hard time but it's real the application is this how many times do we see a need but we claim we are too busy to do anything about that need we see someone in help but we don't do anything we don't help them we just move along in our day thinking someone else will do it someone else will someone else will bless that person Someone else will, will pay it forward and get that person their coffee. Whatever, whatever the case may be, the Lord impresses something upon our hearts. And sometimes we're like, I'm not, I'm busy. <laughs> I, I got to get to work or I got to do this or I got to do that. And we don't tend to the need that the Lord has put right in front of our faces. But that's exactly how nothing ever gets done. Thinking that someone else is going to do all oh, some, uh, you know, Christ's community will take care of it. They're bigger. They got, you know, they got all kind of ministries. We, we don't need to, we just need to go home. 
we, you know, we, we just come to service anyways on Sunday. We don't even meet during the week in a building. That's just a crock. It's a lie from the pit of hell. That's how nothing gets done. An easy example is this. It's like a family. Everybody uses the dishes, right? This happens a lot when you live with roommates. <laughs> when we have roommates, oh, man. It's, it's like, Veronica, get out of here. <laughs> everybody uses the dishes. Everybody walking by the, the, the kitchen, you see the dishes piled up. Nobody want to do the dishes. Well, I mean, you're going to have a bunch of dirty dishes because nobody wants to get in there and pull their sleeves up and do the work. The Bible tells us clearly in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. If you close your ears to the cry of the poor, when you cry out, the Lord is not going to answer you or me. Instead, we are called to be a blessing to others. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 tells us, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. It will pour, be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And this is not even necessarily in regards to monetary blessings. This is in context spiritual blessings. You engaged with the people around you, you prayerfully considering people, you investing in the lives of those around you, you are going to receive peace and joy unspeakable because your desire to be a blessing to those around you. Think about the people that you bless in your families. I know you guys are hardworking in here. I know you guys are going through all kinds of things where you're being tugged from many angles and there's a lot of need and you're meeting those needs. It may be difficult. It may be hard, but you are going to be blessed beyond what you could even receive because your heart is in the right place. And it starts with your heart being right with God. He's never going to give you something that you're not going to be able to walk through with him. It's just, again, our obedience level. Our obedience level has to be on par with what he thinks it should be. And that means total, total submission. Think of it this way. If our hearts are wicked and not thoroughly being cleansed daily, how can we reach out to others with the love of Jesus Christ? We can't. You're going to be so convicted, you're not even going to be able to open your mouth. But if you're living in a right relationship with Jesus Christ... You are, it's going to be so much easier. It's going to flow out of you because, again, you can't contain the living water that you're intaking. You have to give it out. You have to give it out because it's not meant to be sitting in, in, in here. It's supposed to be exposed to other people. The restoration of the house of David, this is very important as well. Zerubbabel, the heir of David, is promised high status. The Lord who removed the ring of the Davidic house now promises that he will restore David's house. Jeremiah chapter 22 verses 24 through 27 tell us, As I live, declares the Lord, through Koina, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, where the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would tear you off and give you into the hand of those who seek your life, into the hand of those who of whom you are now afraid, even to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you and the mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land to which they will long to run, there they shall not return. So the Messiah will come. The Messiah will return. The building of the rebuilding of the temple is all part of this. As I begin to bring this to a close in these last few moments we have together, again, how does the book of Haggai apply to my life? Well, the first thing is this. At one point in time, we've all been reluctant builders. What do I mean by that? Meaning, at one point in time, you and I never considered the Lord's will and purpose for our lives. We just lived how we wanted to live. We didn't, we didn't think that we were to live for God. We just did what we wanted to do. Full of selfishness, greed, and pride. But praise be to God Almighty because he alone has the power to break that in a person's heart and he has all the power to create a fresh and a new in someone. Amen? And the second thing is we must consider our ways. 
the fruitless prosperity of a life that doesn't honor God because that's the reality. It doesn't, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how good you look. I don't care how physically in shape you are. I don't care how much bouillon you have because that's the thing now too is people are investing in gold because they're real, realizing that the 401ks and all that stuff is going down the drain. Whatever, you know, loaf of, a bag, of, a bag of gold, buy a loaf of bread, that's end times. I don't care if you got all the gold in the world. It still doesn't matter. Fruitless prosperity if you don't honor God. You see, we want things to go well for us, but if we don't put the Lord's work before our own, we will always be let down. Don't miss this, church. The true transformation in all of this is really not even about our own desires. Because if our desires aren't even right to begin with, doing the Lord's work is not going to grant us our sinful pleasures. The whole point is, somewhere along the process, putting God first, our desires become rearranged. Our desires go from being all about what we want to all about what God wants in the lives of people around us. An example of this is, you're going to do far better. If you were given $100, we'll just take the little 10% tithing, uh, you know, just as an example. You're better off with $90 and tithing the 10 to God than to keep the $100 for yourself and thinking you're making out because you got $100 in your pocket. You're going to do far more with 90 and honoring God than keeping it all for yourself. If you rob God, you were only deceiving yourself. And that's with your time, your talent, anything. Don't rob God. Amen. The third is this. If we are about our father's business, he promises we will progress. The restoration and healing of souls is of the utmost importance to Jesus Christ. That is why he gave his life, church, so humanity could eternally be forgiven. When we honor and obey his commands, we always end up better for it. Many times, not by the world's standards, but we are better in his eyes. And that's what should matter to us the most. How are we doing in God's eyes? I don't care what what Twitter says. I don't care what Snapchat says. I don't care about these YouTube views on, on this sermon. I care about, am I honoring you and what you've called me to do? That should be our hearts. You see, because we are being molded and shaped more into the moral image of Jesus Christ himself. Consider your ways. Are you living holy? Are you being defiled? Are you repenting and being blessed? And I'll end with this as Isaiah and Michelle come up. The application is this. Haggai's encouragement to rebuild the temple in the face of the Jews' neglect brings to mind the Apostle Paul's exhortation to believers about building our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ. I think there's no better way to end this message than with this portion of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 down through 17. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take and care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that holy temple. Today, ask yourself this. Are you building a life that reflects your status as a temple of the Holy Spirit, leaving a legacy that will stand the test of time? Find encouragement on this construction project from this Old Testament prophet and bless the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for or just this important message, Lord. You're telling us to be about your business. You're telling us that we need to love people and live it out. Lord, give us the ability to do it. We need your love. 
We, we need your love. That's the most important thing. Give us hearts that love people. Help us to love when it's hard. Help us to love when it hurts. Help us to love when it's not to our advantage. Lord, may we be those that truly live out the calling because your son gave his life so that we could be renewed, so that we could be a blessing to those around us. Father, thank you for being so merciful to us. Thank you for your correction. Thank you for your instruction. Now would you empower us to leave this building and live it out. Father, I thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus Christ's name that I pray.